Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. Now, I have here a very special guest. Please welcome to the show, Michael Lynn Thompson. Michael, how are you, my friend? Don't know that I could be any better. It's good to be here. Well, well, listen, if I was to tell people that you have a, a PhD in biology as well as in business administration, uh, administration you run a Live, Learn, and Prosper website to help people you know, in life choices, they mm -hmm. might not even believe me if I tacked on the fact that you spent 45 years incarcerated and was one of the highest ranking members of the Aryan Brotherhood while that you spent that time in prison. They would probably not correlate those two sets of facts together, but that is very true in your case. It is, yes. It. Um, the one thing about me is that uh, when I went to prison, I couldn't read or write, and um, I spent so much time in solitary confinement that uh, I used that time towards my education. So I'm dyslexic and um, huge learning curve there. So what um, usually takes uh, the average individual, um, say, a day to accomplish something would take me three days. So wow. it's just a matter of developing my own study protocol. And when you're sitting in, in bedrock, when you're sitting in a cell, a cage, um, you have that opportunity. So I took the opportunity and, and um, sought and received my education. Well, and it, you know, you've done an excellent job because in prep for this interview, as we were just speaking off air, you know, I've listened to a lot of the stuff you've done here recently with guys like, you know, Sean Atwood, you and him done some tremendous interviews together. So shout out to mm -hmm. Sean Atwood, but you're very articulate in the way you speak. Um, Thank you. you know, you're very, you're very to the point and you have a way of, of storytelling when you put someone there with you in the story almost. And that's not a, a trait that everybody possesses. Mm. And so you, you've done a good job, obviously self self-taught, I would assume. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. let's get into a little bit of your story here, man. I mean, obviously, you know, things pick up, you know, around your twenties, but you know, what was early life like? Because you were born in what, 1951, correct? Yeah, 51. I'm 71 now. And um, my early life was, um, I lived on and off the reservation in uh, Big Pine, California. It's um, at the base of Mount Whitney. Um, beautiful area. And, um, but um, the res itself back then, you want to remember this is back in the 50s, um, was pretty much uh, steeped in abject poverty. So, uh, as I said, I lived on and off the reservation, but at the age of 12, I went to live with uh, my elder, he who walks on top of the wind. I just referred to him as walks on top. He owned an Arabian horse ranch and he ran uh, black Angus cattle, cattle up in the Cleveland National Forest in Southern California. So um, growing up, it was um, horsemanship and um, cattle and rodeos and hunting and fishing and all the things that you might associate with um, that type of life. Okay. Now... In 1973, things mm -hmm. take a drastic turn for you. But before I get into that, I want to ask, like, I, I know a little bit about the story. And obviously, I'll get you to kind of clarify that, clarify that for our listeners that maybe aren't up to snuff. But how did you, what was your relationship like to get involved in this where you were charged with a double murder? How did you know the guy that they were trying to to kidnap his daughter? I actually didn't know him. Um, okay. There was an individual, well... The woman that I was married to at the time, I just returned from the rodeo circuit and uh, was back in town maybe a couple of weeks. And uh, her cousin, um, who uh, just, I think, a year before had been released from custody uh, after spending, I think, nine years in Soledad prison, uh, was working for two individuals, uh, drugs. And um, it was actually him, uh, his name was Lewis, that... Um, informed me of this kidnap plot to kidnap two little girls. Um, their father was uh, the leader of a drug cartel, and it was apparently well known that he kept large sums of money. Is that John Solis? Yes, it is John Solis. Uh, that he kept large sums of money in his residence. So um, both these individuals were out on bail themselves um, for drug trafficking, and um, apparently the plan was that uh, they would kidnap his two little girls for ransom. And uh, once having, having received the ransom money would have gone to Canada. Um, at least those factors came out in court. 
And um, but insofar as John Solis, I um, I did some work for him. I built some shelves. I did a lot of um, um, construction work back then, along with ranch work and farm work. But uh, I'd bid on a um, um, a job, and he had a Mexican food factory. And um, I don't know that I actually ever met him, but I bid on the job. I took the job. I built the shelves. And so that when uh, Lewis advised me about this um, alleged kidnap plot, um, I asked him to inform John Solis of you know what was going to occur. And um, he didn't want to get involved. He worked for the two individuals that were actually going to perpetrate the kidnap. Uh, um, so I re I got the phone number from him, and I called John Solis and and uh, told him what I knew, and that was the extent of my involvement. And that parlayed itself into you because of the felony murder rule mm -hmm. in charge yeah. of the double homicide. Now, this this I guess attempted kidnapping actually did take place, but John was ready for it. I'm assuming, and and it mm -hmm. didn't work out quite like they were planning. Yeah, my understanding is is that the the two individuals did attempt to kidnap the two little girls, but in the process of that, they were disarmed, and their weapons were actually used against them to kill them, and then they were buried. Um, and um, you know that's essentially what brought everything to trial was the discovery of the bodies uh, in a grave, um, and then um, I was implicated. Uh, by way of my ex-wife and her cousin, and um, really my two co-defendants, John Solis and Mike Sesma. Wow. And so the felony murder rule, because you were involved, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, any action resulting in the death or murder of these two individuals, that basically puts you right there, you know, in the mix of that to carry that load. And that's a little oversimplified. It's it's a, a little more complex than that. But yes, to answer your question, it's the felony murder rule. And I'm actually back in court on that right now after almost 50 years. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I heard that you were back in court to try to get that um, uh, exonerated. Um, there's a process here in California that uh, provides for uh, an individual petitioning the court when the jury has been instructed under the natural and probable consequences associated with the crime. Um, to petition the court to come back in and essentially retry the circumstances associated with the alleged aiding and abetting that brought about the conviction. And that's the case with me. So I petitioned the court initially. The um, district attorney challenged it on constitutionality, but my circumstances went back so far that they didn't apply. The appellate court ruled in my favor. I went back before the Superior Court and... Um, they ruled that um, I was guilty as a matter of law, which was um, inappropriate. So we went back into the appellate court, and just recently they ruled in my favor. So we're back in superior court on the merits. Okay. So essentially, there will be a new trial uh, as it relates to this, and I'll have the opportunity to uh, present evidence that wasn't previously presented. Well, that's one thing I wanted to talk about too, because if if mm -hmm. I heard right, you had a lawyer who was a family friend. Weren't you trying to do like an adoption or something at the time? That I was, was. Your family mm -hmm. adoption. Yeah, he was a family law attorney. And I, you know, being the youngster that I was and not really familiar with the legal system, uh, I didn't understand the distinction between family law and criminal law. Right. So that when I was arrested on this, I just simply retained him um, to take on this case. He had never handled the criminal case. So he was very much out of his depth. And pro but probably didn't want to turn down the money, I'm assuming, because criminal uh, cases are not cheap, believe me. <laughs> no, they're, they're not, and, and, and that may have had something to do with it. Yeah. Now, ultimately, what did you guys, just, how did you do it? Did, what, did you take a plea, or were you found guilty? What, how was the, the verdict handed down? Because I know you no, got a seven years to life sentence. I got a seven-year seven year life sentence on... Uh, two first-degree murders, first-degree conspiracy, kidnapping, and assault. Um, yeah. That's ridiculous in itself. I mean, all you did was technically just warn the guy. I mean, it's... Well, Sesma testified. He initially went into court and said that I had nothing to do with it. And um, over the weekend, um, 
he apparently had a change of heart, came back in that Monday and said that I was present at the scene and that I, I had assaulted one of the victims. So the contention was, I was the only one charged with assault, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that assault really provided the predicate. That's what I was referred to previously when I said it was a, a little more complicated than that. Right. But it was the alleged assault, the lying in wait, and the jury was instructed that if they found that I lie in wait to commit that assault, then I was guilty of first-degree murder and first-degree conspiracy. Yeah. And, and that's the issue. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. The lying and waiting part is where I can get you because that's what well, premeditation, I guess it would be. Yeah, yeah it, it's intent. But the issue here is, is that uh, a lying in wait to commit great bodily injury, assault with great bodily injury, uh, does not uh, constitute the predicate for murder and, and, and the intent to murder. So, um, which, if you think about it logically, makes sense. Yeah. So it was an erroneous instruction is really what it comes down to. Now, did you did you take a plea or were you found guilty in giving that sentence? Oh, no, I was found guilty. I didn't take a plea. I maintained my innocence throughout. And, um, you know, that's why I spent essentially 45 years in prison right. uh, was because each time I went before the parole board, I refused to admit to the crime. And um, even though they changed the law here in California that uh, did not require um, an individual a prisoner to admit to the crime, um, and they had ways of getting around that. Yeah. So, and you're what, 22 at this time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of people, when they hear like seven years to life, they think, some mm -hmm. people think, oh, well, you can get out in seven years. And then you have the life that, you know, different ca different states and different areas have different times. Sometimes mm -hmm. life, you have, you have to do life. You know, sometimes you can mm -hmm. do certain percentages of your sentence. Were you mm -hmm. aware of, you know, the, what that seven years to life sentence was at the time? Well, I was. I mean, you had uh, three categories. This is back before California enacted its determinate sentencing law. Right. So it's called an indeterminate sentence. And all prisoners at that time either served one year to life, five years to life, or seven years to life. Now, what that means as a seven years to life is that in seven years, I am eligible for parole. And I was eligible for parole after serving seven years. Um, but it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, even though I'm eligible for parole, um, very, very rarely does an individual succeed at his initial parole hearing in um, receiving parole. Yeah. So what is going through your mind here at 22 years old and, and you mm -hmm. get that sentence? I mean, that's yeah, obviously, I, and I'm, I don't mean to step out of line, but I'm assuming you had never been in any trouble before. Definitely not to the extent of this. No, you're not stepping out of line. You feel free to ask any question you want, um, and I'll do my best to answer it. But, you know, it's difficult to describe what was going on with me, especially emotionally. You know, at that point in time, given the uh, case itself and having gone through that and never been in trouble, and so, you know, going through a murder trial, uh, that can be somewhat daunting, and it was. Um, so your focus is not so much on what's going on with you emotionally, and, and that was certainly true in my case, but more so um, your survival. So, you know, I was looking to um, understand the environment in which I now lived and, um, you know, the politics associated with that because they're, they're um, substantial. Mm -hmm. And um, learning the ins and outs of uh, what it is to be incarcerated, what it is to be uh, maintained in a cage. And, um, you know, if I had any difficulty, it was that initially, but, um, you know, I addressed that at, um, at the onset of my incarceration and then essentially moved on towards, um, learning about my environment. Well, the one thing that you have on your side going in is you are a pretty big guy. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that helps. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. it can draw attention just as much as if you're a small guy, but you know, having that size on your, on your side, so to speak, you're going to be A's probably sought after for gangs, which you were to, mm -hmm. to join them. And mm -hmm. then obviously you're going to get people that just wants to try you to see where they stand and to see where you stand. Yeah. Um, it's a male characteristic. You're right. Yeah. You know, that idea of competition and well, he's a big fellow. Let's, let's see what he's got. And that, that did happen. Um, and not unexpectedly, the, the blessing I suppose for me is that, um, the elder who raised me, uh, 
also taught me um, self-defense tactics. And um, so I was not only a large young man, but um, I had a certain skill set that I was able to employ um, towards my survival. Now, your first year in, were you at Chino in your first year? Yes. Uh-huh. That's the reception center. Okay. How long were you at Chino? Uh, briefly, you when you go into a reception center, what happens is they do a, a battery of psychological evaluations to determine whether or not they want to give you a job. I mean, it's somewhat ridiculous when you're serving a life sentence uh, to determine whether or not you need a vocation, whether you need education, and so on. Um, but uh, you still have to go through the motions, and I did. And once that was determined, I was scheduled to ship out to San Quentin. But in fact, uh, on the day that I was supposed to go to San Quentin, um, there were no beds available. They were at full capacity. So they redirected um, my location to dual vocational institution, which is in Tracy. Tracy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Tracy, isn't that where you get into the knife fight with uh, Yogi? No, that's at all Folsom. I'd, I'd uh, gotten into an altercation at Tracy, a few of them actually, and as a result of smuggling a gun into the prison there, a gun, a box of shells, and I'd made a suppressor. It was a revolver, so a silencer's not really going to work, but it does suppress um, the weapon somewhat. But um, while I was charged with the um, suppressor, uh, they were unable to find the gun. And um, someone had told on me the fact that there was a gun present in the prison. And um, so as a result of that, I was shipped off to Old Folsom. And that's where I encountered Yogi Pinnell. Okay. So your first night fight in Tracy, how did the first one come about? Like your first ever night fight? Yeah, that was a situation. I was raised native and um, I walked what's called the Red Road. And um, but in prison at that time, it was against the law to practice our ways or even speak our language. And um so my first job is with the chaplain. Uh, he was a great guy. Leon England was his name, Protestant chaplain. And we had an agreement. And the agreement was is that uh, as long as I maintained the chapels, there was two chapels, and uh, dividing the chapels was a rather large garden. So we made the agreement that he would allow me to practice my ways in the garden, and um, um, I would maintain his chapels. So that's what I did. I would... I would be out in the, the garden practicing my way, singing, dancing, and um, involving myself in different rituals and ceremonies. And apparently I had been observed by the Catholic priest in the chapel across the way. And um, unfortunately, I think due to his ignorance as it relates to those ways, um, he perceived what I was doing as devil worship. Um, and I can actually understand that to a degree. Um, but um, his parishioners took issue with his objection to what I was doing. And the uh, dominant gang there at the prison at the time was the Nuestra Familia. So they made arrangements for seven of the parishioners there to um, attack me in the garden while I was practicing my ways. And they did. Um, it... Um, you know, I've heard per people, as I've told this story previously, attempt to interpret it, you know, that I defeated seven trained assassins and gang members. And it wasn't really anything like that. It was more uh, a Keystone Cop type episode where once um, they came out of the door, it's a large door. They all had knives taped into their hands. And um, I simply, once I knew what was going on, I dropped the point man of the wedge as they came out the door and the other six just essentially fumbled out into the garden. And um, I methodically, um, I've used the word dispatched them. And uh, essentially what I did was I put them down. And um, it was not that difficult. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that I'm some reincarnation of Bruce Lee, um, because I'm not. Um, but I am a skilled fighter. And... Um, so I was able to do that. That led into um, an altercation right after that on the main yard against the leadership of the Nuestra Familia. So that continued to escalate. 
and I was involved in a number of altercations as a result, which led up to the smuggling of the gun into the prison. How the hell did you get a gun into a prison? Well, at that time, a lot of the prisons had their own dairies. And so it was a matter of finding an individual, which I did, who worked out on the dairy. So I had a gun buried out on the dairy uh, by people on the street. Okay. And, um, but problem was they'd wrapped it in plastic and they buried it. And so really it was um, a psychological advantage, I think more so than anything else, because he had brought the gun in in a jock strap in the front of his britches. And um, he used the idea that each and every time he came in, um, he was carrying uh, pornography magazines, um, you know, Playboy and Hustler and things like that, which were back then were allowed in the prison. And so he and the guard that was at the um, search post um, were quite big into these magazines. So he used that to manipulate the guard um, in bringing the gun in. So once the gun was in, we discovered that it had some rust on it. So it had to be, it was put in a number 10 coffee can full of oil um, to remove the rust. And, uh, but uh, while that was being done, uh, the fact that the gun was present in the prison was revealed to the administration, and that's when they gaffled me up. Oh, okay. All right, that makes sense. Now, I actually, and we spoke about this off here also, the first time I remember seeing you and your story was on the Gangland episode mm. of Aryan Brother. Mm -hmm. And there was a term you used then, and uh, I I'm sure some people will get the reference, but it was keister stash. How mm -hmm. y'all would get a lot of these weapons in and out. Yeah. And I won't break it down too much into detail here. I'm sure you people can Google it and find out exactly what what it, what that is. But to me, that seems a little edgy doing that with a knife. Like, how were you guys able to do that? And then I remember you were saying in there, I, at one time you were having trouble getting the knife out to use it. You had to lay down on the ground. Yeah, that was actually in um, a knife fight I had with Yogi Pinnell at Folsom. That was actually my first experience in keistering a weapon. And and for your viewers, keistering a weapon is secreting an object in your rectum. Yeah. And because you have to go oftentimes through a century of guards who are searching you, you have to have a means by which to get the weapon out to the yard, and that's the only means you have. So in prison terminology, it's called the safe. And... Um, but the episode that you're talking about, the circumstance that you're talking about, was that I had not, I had no previous experience with that. And uh, so while I was able to actually keister stash the weapon um, that I was taking out to the yard that day, I had enormous difficulty uh, attempting to remove that weapon from my rectum. And um, it was difficult. Wow. Now, Yogi, was he... Black Gorilla Family? Who, who was he affiliated with? No, he was actually Black Panther. Black Panther, that's right. Okay. And he now, started his own organization later. But now he actually approached you to join the Black Panthers. Yeah, via the uh, prisoner grapevine. Um, it was well known by the time I got to Folsom, the altercation I had been in with um, these individuals in the chapel garden and otherwise. And um, so... It was known that, uh, you know, I was a practicing native. And um, so the perception was, is that I was native as opposed to white. Um, but I don't know that that really mattered because Yogi himself was Nicaraguan, but he was the field marshal for um, the Black Panthers at the time. Okay. So when you turn Yogi down, mm -hmm. that was what, what in... I guess what was the first stepping stone to you and him actually having the knife fight? It was, I mean, he attempted to recruit me and, and he explained essentially what was a communist manifesto to me. And in truth, I didn't have the intellect to even comprehend what he was telling me um, about communism and, uh, and what it meant. But I did know that I was an American and I understood that from having been raised with the Western ethos. So my response to him was to decline his offer because I was American. And um, his response to that was that 
Um, I was either with them or against them. And so I informed him then, well, I'm against you. And he said, well, that being the case, um, he called me Young Mike. He said, Young Mike, you go on in and you make yourself a knife and I'll meet you out here in the morning. And so that's what I did. And it took all night. And so we met the next morning. We went head up. Um, he lost. And um, in losing to me, he actually ran. Um, once he realized that he was losing. So I chased him across the yard. And in the course of that, I was shot with the Mini-14 in the back. And uh, But prior to that, two of his bodyguards had attempted to intercept me. And uh, I had stabbed them. And then I was shot. Um, so that led up to a lot, a lot of other altercations in Old Folsom itself. Wow. And you've been shot, what, like 20-something times, right? 22 times, yeah. 22 times, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming these are mostly from guards at the prison. Well, yeah, they're all from guards in the prison. Um, you, whether it be a variety of weapons. Um, you know, the one I remember the most is the, the shotgun. I took five rounds in the back um, at about eight feet away um, with a shotgun, and it pretty much made hamburger out of me. And had I not had the mass on my back that I did at the time, the doctor told me that it would have penetrated my heart and my lungs. Yeah, that was another benefit to, if people look at, you know, some of the pictures of, of guys like yourself and, you know, and T.D. Bingham and some other guy, you know, you guys had some pretty good muscle size on The majority of them did. And that was actually, you know, kind of a twofold. Obviously, you're in better physical condition to be able to handle altercations. But, you know, the bullets, when you get shot, the muscle acts as a protectant, you know. To some I'm degree. going to agree with you, yeah, because I believe that's true. You know, both T.D. and I were, were pushing over 500 on the bench at that time. And it was TD and I that day that were actually in an altercation with the Mexican mafia. So while I took five rounds, so did he. And, um, you know, we both uh, obviously survived it. Um, but, it, um, you know, I think I'd rather be hit with a mini 14 or I was hit once with an odd six. And, you know, while it drops you like a sack of potatoes and takes your wind. And if you're lucky enough to remain conscious, um, it's not as devastating I think holistically as being shot with the shotgun. Oh, God. Um, who was the first person to approach you about joining the Aryan Brotherhood? That was T.D. Bingham. T.D. Bingham. Now, you yeah. initially turned him down? I did, yeah. Okay, why did you turn him down? Well, you want to remember that um, I'm not the, the sharpest tack in the box at that time, and uh, but uh, I have um, a general sense of what I think is going on. And my perception of the brand at that time was that they were all dope fiends. Okay. And, um, you know, like anybody that hears Aryan, um, you automatically assume that uh, must be neo-Nazi or some form of white supremacy. And um, I certainly wasn't with that. Um, and actually, uh, I can recall uh, saying that to TD, and he attempted to explain to me that they were not um, white supremacists, uh, but I shut him down. And just told him that I would think about it. and uh, But for now, I was just going to do my own time. It wasn't until sometime later when four Native Americans, who were also members of the brand, the AB, uh, approached me. And, um, you know, they essentially told me. They, they knew that I uh, had been partially raised on a res. And that I was what we refer to as an old res dog. So, um, and they said, look, brother, we... We live better in here than we ever did on the res. And in fact, it was true. Um, so they began to explain to me how they controlled the resources and how they went about controlling those resources. So based on that conversation um, with those Native men, um, it was actually the individual who was actually talking to me of the floor, his name was Bear. Um, and um, three were... Pit River, one was my due. And, uh, but as a result of that conversation, I made the decision to join the brand. Well, TD himself was part Jewish, correct? Yes. Yes. He has a Star David tattooed on his body. And, and I noticed it. And he noticed that I noticed it. 
and said, yes, he says, I'm, I'm Jewish, I'm proud of it. He says, but I'm not a practicing Jew. And, um, you know, again, um, I don't know that um, I really understood what he meant by a practicing Jew. Right. Uh, it's only in retrospect that um, I have the opportunity to discern what um, a lot of what was going on back there actually meant. Now, with some of the other guys that were some of the original members there, were they around at this time? Guys like Barry Mills, was he there at this time as also? Barry was in San Quentin and okay. then was subsequently went to do federal time. Um, but yeah, you had uh, other members there, the, the four individuals that I was talking about, Spotsburgs, Bobby Moore. Um, about John Gershner? No, John was a federal prisoner. Federal. And, um, you know, he didn't make it to the state until um, sometime in the 2000s. Could have been a little bit earlier than that, but um, he, he was, um, he did his time in the feds. And he's still in prison, correct? I believe he's been released. Is he? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if yeah. I'm, I'm not mistaken, I know you've been in jail for a long time, but there was a, a TV show by the name of Sons of Anarchy, mm -hmm. and which was out of uh, California. And they went into, I can't remember if it was Stockton prison or whatever prison they went into. Mm -hmm. But they're obviously going in as a motorcycle gang. And right. Sonny Barger, who I'm, mm -hmm. I think you know is a, you know, de facto leader of the Hells Angels, Mm -hmm. He played a part uh, as a, a biker in there. And mm -hmm. so they're trying to get protection because the black gorilla mm -hmm. family in this particular scene is, you know, after him in prison and they know it. So they reach out to the Aryans and he says, Lenny, the pimp, which was Sonny Barger's name in the show. He said, Lenny, the pimp's a brother. We're looking for the protection. And I'm pretty sure that was John Gershon looks at him and said, well, the MC don't mean shit in here. If you want protection, you got to pay us. Right. He's and, essentially right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was actually, I mean, I can remember um, in the 70s when Sonny was in Folsom that uh, we provided protection. And, um, you know, and oftentimes the idea of providing protection to individuals is misconstrued as meaning that they're weak or they're in, in need. But essentially in prison, what it comes down to is numbers. Mm -hmm. So whereas on the streets, uh, Sonny and other members of the Hells Angels um, wouldn't have any problems uh, because their numbers are there and their support systems and their resources are there in prison, not so. Mm -hmm. So there may only be a few of them. The same is true with like John Gotti. Right. You know, the yeah. brand provided protection to John Gotti for the same reason. He didn't have enough of his people in the prison to essentially provide protection for him. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and that's jumping ahead a minute, but since you brought it up, I'll go ahead and and speak on that. So John Gotti for, and most people know that man's name. He was the leader of the Gambinos went to jail when Sammy Gravano uh, became a government witness mm -hmm. and it's reported. And I've heard refutes and then, you know, claims and whatnot that he was paying you guys, but then at some point he stopped paying protection mm -hmm. because he felt he had enough of his own people in there to provide that. And then that wasn't so. And then he actually got assaulted in prison by an individual and then is that when he went back and tried to get the protection reinstated it's an interesting story um you know the and, truth and that's is one reason why i love to have you on because i've i've heard this mentioned but never in detail of exactly what happened so I've, I've been waiting on this question to ask you for weeks now <laughs> essentially what it comes down to is uh the contention was as the story goes that he didn't feel that he needed protection because he had sufficient resources within the prison and so that um, the brand made it possible uh, for him to be touched, and he was touched. Um, and so as a result of having been touched, um, he sought protection. Okay. So but the contention I'm... is the contention is is that the brand facilitated um, his initial beating. Yeah. Now, can you confirm nor deny that? I can confirm it, yes. So they did facilitate that. Yes. And was that from Walter Johnson? That I don't know. Okay. Well, I know that the, there's a picture that's floating around the internet where it's, it's been floating around. It hasn't recently served. It's been around for years. But there is a picture of John Gotti in the prison war with blood on his forehead where you can tell he did get roughed up. And, and from what the reports that I've read, once he did seek out you guys for that protection, 
uh, the deal was he wanted Walter Johnson killed, but that never did play, take place. And it was also up to assumption if they were even going to, you know, take care of him anyway. I do know Walter wound up getting transferred out of that prison. Mm-hmm. And I think he later died. Um, I don't know if it was in something he got out. And I think it might've been something outside of the prison where he got shot mm-hmm. by a cop. It wasn't even by anything mm-hmm. you know, gang related. Um, That's not unusual. Yeah. No, not at all. But in the case of John Gotti, the idea of uh, contracts, um, you know, whether it be Walter Johnson or anybody else, I can tell you that that discussion was had. It was one of the um, business characteristics associated with John Gotti. He had enormous resources on the streets available to him. And of course, at that time, the brand was attempting to structure itself along the same lines as the Italian mob. Um, business-wise, um, within organized crime. So the idea had been approached and so far as picking up contracts on the street uh, on behalf of the Italian mob. That I can say. Okay. Now, did you ever, you weren't in the same prisons with him at any point in time, were you? Did you ever actually? No, I, was, I, was, I was never in the feds. Okay. Um, had to, so did he continue paying for protection up until the point to where he ultimately probably, I'm assuming, went to that medical facility and at that time probably didn't need it as much? Yes. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned earlier the brand. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people that don't know, you know, we've talked Aryan Brotherhood. Then when you say the brand, that's actually something you guys took from what, uh, Louis L'Amour's book? Well, yeah, that's the contention. I mean, that would be the easiest way to explain it when – it's part of the Western ethos again. You know, I grew up with that Western ethos, as did other individuals who were members of the brand, um, not the least of which were the Native Americans. So, and you'll find it in Louis L'Amour books. Um, that's why the comparative analysis. Um, but essentially what it means is that when an individual rides for a particular brand, um, then he's loyal to that brand. And um, and so that's where it comes from. It's part of that Western ethos. And, and then of course, that brand delivers its own brand of justice. That's right. Okay. Now, but that wasn't a term. Was that a term that was already used at that time? Or is that something y'all kind of come up with around that time? Well, same time. I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. You know, it, it's it's how you refer to yourself. Okay. You know? hmm. um, was there any initiation process for you? joining the brand no it um really wasn't wasn't required you okay. know when you stop and think about the idea of i've heard a lot about blood in blood out right and um you get that more so from law enforcement than you do anybody else what they do is they use um their sources usually who are associates who provide them with information and then they project that information to the public as gospel but um, it isn't to say that an individual coming into the brand uh, doesn't have to get his bones. And getting his bones is essentially um, demonstrating his physical prowess and his ability to control his environment by himself. Mm-hmm. And that was a requirement. So when you join in, it only takes you roughly a year. And then at that point, and like you said, you were putting in place infrastructure similar mm-hmm. to how organized crime did on the streets with the, the hierarchy, you know, the different levels of, mm-hmm. you know, I guess you'd say guys that were in charge and you're actually put in charge of what the state commission of the AB. Yeah. I think it was you, mm-hmm. Clifford Smith, Wendell Blue Norris and Richard Bart Simpson, Terflinger, is that how you say his last name? Terflinger. Yeah. And, um, but um, no, the issue there was, is that initially it was um, uh, myself and this was a vote that was taken nationally. It was myself and um, Robert Griffin and um, T.D. Bingham. But then T.D. Bingham paroled. And so Wendell Norris took his place. Okay. And that, and that happened within a very um, short time span. Clifford um, nor Richard um, Turfelinger uh, ever became um, members in that capacity. Okay. Um, but um, Turflinger is is one of the original members. Um, and uh, 
but like I said, it was it was based on a vote. Okay. Now there was another member that I wanted to talk about, and I was doing some research on him, uh, mm -hmm. Thomas Silverstein. Yeah, Tommy. Mm -hmm. Now he actually killed a CO. I got a, a, I think the story that I read, and you can in shed light on this if I'm correct, but he was walking through. He was handcuffed at the time. Someone either slipped or was able to take get his cuffs off. And then I guess he had a weapon or, or somebody gave him a weapon. And then he stabbed a guard to death on the tier. Is that right? Uh, it's a little more gruesome than that. Um, you know, Tommy had been having problems with um, an officer. Yeah. And, um, you know, the tragedy, I suppose, in this, this incident is that the officer that he killed was one of the good guys. I mean, you have good, good guards, bad guards. Okay. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. see what I had read was that Tommy was a big artist, which I'm sure, you know, and that this mm -hmm. guard kept messing with him and, and taking his, his art supplies. Well, Tommy was being messed with, Okay. you know, but that's, that's a relative term and it's subjective, mm -hmm. you know, on the part of Tommy and so far as him thinking that he's being messed with. But uh, the issue here is that he was under escort um, and uh, in handcuffs. And so he leaned into a cell. We always had handcuff keys available and knives. And he leaned into a cell. They removed the cuffs, handed him a knife, and he proceeded to um, butcher the guard. Now, um, he essentially, the guard's son was on the other side of the grill gate as um, Tommy was stabbing him. And Tommy was aware of that. So he drug this young man's father up to him and essentially decapitated him in front of his son. So pretty gruesome. Holy shit. He was a, his son was a, a CO? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And I read that there was two other guards there at the time, but when, when he started stabbing that guy, those two just took off. They didn't want any part of it. That's actually what they're instructed to do. I've been in oh, situations. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. In San Quentin, um, I was under escort on the tier in handcuffs. And uh, it was the same situation there. At that time, um, the BGF were attempting to kill me. Um, and so one of its members had cut the bars out of his cell. So while I was under escort, um, he attempted to come out of his cell. The problem was is that he hadn't cut out enough bars and he got stuck. But the moment he came out, he had his hands in front of him, and he had a fairly substantial bone crusher in his hand. But the moment that I and the guards saw him, the guards turned and ran off the tier, ran off the tier. And so I went to a cell and had the handcuffs removed and obtained a knife and went down. And um, it was really kind of comical. Um, I suppose I could have killed him, but um, I didn't see any value in that. And uh, so essentially what I did was um, took the bone crusher away from him and pushed him back in his cell. Um, and, um, you know, that's that in and of itself is an entire story. But I tell the story to emphasize um, Tommy's situation where um, it was very easy for him to have the cuffs removed to receive a weapon. And um, another AB member right after him um, killed another guard and stabbed two other guards. Um, and that was for the reason that he just didn't want Tommy to have a, a bigger body count. Than essentially. Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, but one thing, you know, people, I think when they hear these stories, they say, oh, well, they're just, you know, brutal bunch of guys or whatever. Mm. Very, very smart and sophisticated. You guys were having inmates that were brands act as their own attorney. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but in doing so, you could call other brand members to that prison for them to be testifying and essentially made it able for you guys to talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, that, that was a common practice uh, so that you pick up a case. You oftentimes don't even have to go uh, in what's called pro per uh, self-representation, mm -hmm. but um, in many cases you do. And so what you do is you utilize the subpoena process. You call members from different States or throughout the state and you bring them all to one facility, and then you have essentially what's called a confab. Um, you sit down and, and you discuss business. Wow. And then you guys would also study 
anatomy and the yes. human body. Yes. And the reason for doing that is so when you do get in the knife fights, you know the particular places to try to hit someone to inflict the most damage. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Gray's anatomy is um, required reading. Mm. And um, even if you can't read, it has um, sufficient photographs so that uh, individuals understand uh, strike points mm -hmm. and then those strike points are practiced. And then even communication... I think it was uh, John Gerson that said this, but uh, letters called hit and miss letters, mm -hmm. which were essentially letters written with urine. Well, hit and miss is a carny term, which translated means piss. Okay. Hit and miss, piss. So you're using urine. You're taking a piece of wood or a pencil that you take the lead off of, and uh, you get a cup of urine, and then you get uh, legal paper, which is yellow. And then you take the urine and you write your message on it. It dries and it's clear. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. But when you apply heat to it, like say you roll up some toilet paper and you make a torch and then you heat the paper underneath, it brings out the letters. Holy cow. I mean, that was that something that had been going on for a while? or is that, how, how do you find that out? Uh, essentially trial and error. I mean, it's just like cipher. Um, you know, history is replete with examples um, that one can utilize, mm -hmm. you know, um, codes, for instance, cipher. And I mean, they go back uh, millennia in so far as how those codes were used. Yeah, you guys used also that uh, or Sir Francis Bacon cipher that was mm -hmm. really, right. really intelligent. And uh, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, was that the cipher that used when they waged war on the D.C. Blacks? It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's even complex. I was sitting there when I was researching, I was like, man, that's, that takes a little time to break down that cipher. Like that's not the most simplest one I've ever seen. It's not, but it's uh, effective. Yes. Very, you know, in that and um, can be taught fairly easily. Uh, you know, once you understand the dynamic associated with the cipher itself and, um, and there are other modalities that can be used and were used. And but, that was, um, I think that attack, well, it was in Lewisburg, right? When we started yes. that war with the DC Excuse Blacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, where, what was your standing with the brand at that time? Were you still involved at that time? I believe I was, yeah. It, uh, it's a close association there. You know, when I stepped away, to give you a reference point by way of time, um, prior to Tommy killing the guard, um, I was aware that it was going to happen because of my status. And so that when I stepped away, uh, one of the things that I did was to advise law enforcement that these things were going to happen. But because they had never happened previously, the brand had always taken a position that um, you don't inflict harm on staff because doing so, the consequences of doing so, shut down business and a multitude of other factors. But so they didn't believe that it was going to happen. And they actually polygraphed me on it. And even though I passed the polygraph, um, they still really didn't give it the attention uh, that they should have. Had they done so, perhaps those guards would not have been killed. Wow. Now, and t we talked a little bit earlier about John Gotti and you pr mm -hmm. providing protection, but that's not the only more notable figure that you guys provided protection for. Another one was Charlie Manson. And you talked a little mm -hmm. bit there about the brand do having some, some rules. One of them was, you know, at the time, I know that kind of changed later on, but you know, y'all had certain reservations as far as like women and children, which Charlie mm -hmm. facilitated both with Sharon Tate and her being pregnant at the time of the, the murders. Right. So he actually wanted to become a member of the AB? No, I don't think it ever even entered his mind. Okay. Um, I mean, he understood the, the, Charlie was a con man mm -hmm. and, um, you know, fairly uh, proficient in that when it came to dealing with youngsters. Um, but um, he certainly was um, not in any stretch of the imagination, a man's man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to give you again, a reference point, um, he was in fact a pedophile and, um, 
a con man. And but you guys did see value in Charlie in lieu of his followers, I guess, if you will, because didn't you guys kind of use some of the his followers as women to help smuggle in knives? Yeah, I did. It um it um you know, he had um, a group of girls that uh, were aligned with an organization called Tribal Thumb out of Berkeley. And, um, you know, it at one point in time, once I had learned to read and, and began to apply myself, um, I attended Berkeley myself via correspondence. So that's actually how I attained my um, undergraduate work. So these girls all attended Berkeley and they had an interest in, in um, creating a commune, you know, that egalitarian type society that was uh, pretty popular back in the 60s and 70s. So um, I did utilize them to smuggle weapons into Old Folsom. And um, they were an excellent resource in that regard. Very bold and um, very intelligent, which of course begs the question, uh, given that intelligence, uh, how could they be manipulated by somebody like Charlie Manson, mm -hmm. um, who essentially was just a hustler? Um, and so the answer to that is that while they may have been um, um, intelligent, their emotional intelligence is an entirely different thing. These were immature youngsters, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. And um, so you couple that with the use of hallucinogenics, you know, toward that manipulation, then it begins to make sense. But um, I found them to be very intelligent. Now, wasn't there like, I want to say maybe a metal detectors or something like that, and you figured out a way to wrap the knives up in electrical tape to get past the metal detectors? Yeah, it's a very simple principle. I mean, simple physics. So that, uh, you know, metal detectors work on the premise of electrical eddies. And uh, those um, electrical eddies are projected out at a right angle to a receiver. And uh, when it, they go through the person's body and that receiver um, receives those electrical eddies without the magnetic flux being disrupted as a result of the iron being on the person, uh, then they're able to pass through. But if they're carrying something that has um, iron on them, um, then those uh, electrical eddies penetrate that, and that disrupts the magnetic flux and sets off the alarm. It's really that simple. Um, so, yeah, I, I had the girls um, out of Berkeley go to the San Francisco airport and test my theory, and uh, the theory proved true. And so um, I made um, sheaths for um, folding buck knives. And um, at one point, a five-shot uh, Derringer that was made uh, by an outfit called Freedom Arms. It was made out of stainless steel. And um, so that two of those were smuggled in along with a number of buck knives. And these girls would smuggle them in secreted in their vaginas? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. At what they point would, would they get those out to, to pass off to whoever's receiving? Well, it's understanding that when you come into the visiting room, and, um, you know, for those of us that were in uh, solitary, you have to visit behind plexiglass. So you make arrangements for the porters that work the visiting room to have her pass that off to a porter. Then when you come out to be processed after visiting back to your unit, the porter makes that available to you. And then it's just a matter of keistering that prior to going in to be processed back to your unit. Okay. All right, I got you. So that that was what I was curious of when I was I, I thought that was brilliant of being able to get it number one a through the the metal detector, but then after that I was curious as how that pass off process went. But that makes perfect sense now that you broke it down. Yeah, I had one girl initially. I mean, it, it really a question of of understanding the um, dynamics, but um, they had been so successful in their attempts to take uh, buck knives that were properly wrapped in her sheaths through the metal detectors at the airport, she ended up doing so with a rather um, large Bowie knife. Ooh. And not understanding the dynamic of prison and what would be required to take that back to the unit, she actually smuggled in a Bowie knife. And um, of course, there was no way to uh, keister that and take that back in, it was just simply too large. Yeah, yeah, it was not, it was not a whole lot you can do with that, not many places to put that. <laughs> Would have been nice. Yeah, I bet. Yeah.
Um, there's, uh, we've talked or you've talked in, in previous interviews about a lot of movies, but you're not a big movie watcher, especially as those, as it relates to prison, like movies, like American me shot caller mm -hmm. TV mm -hmm. shows like Oz, but there was a few individuals that I wanted to ask you if you ever had any experience with a guy named Eddie bunker. Do you know Eddie? Yeah, sure. Did you spend time with Eddie? No be so fierce was one of his books. And he was actually an excellent writer. And uh, you know, much of his writing was was based on the brand. And, um, you know, he was a brand member. And, okay, that um, was my question. Was he a brand member? Because the, the, yes. the thing that I was watching, he was talking about him, but it never specifically said if he was. Yeah, you typically don't. But he makes reference to a number of individuals um, who were also brand members in his writings. You know, if you just look at the, the no be no be so fierce, um, you know that um, has a direct correlation uh, to his experiences with the brand. Okay, um, and then he would go on to later where and what he was good friends with uh, Joe Pegleg Morgan, I think. Yeah, Joe. Um, you know, I never referred to Joe as Pegleg, but uh, right. you know, many people do. Joe was a good friend of mine. And um, we did a lot of business together. I knew his family. When he suffered a stroke in prison, uh, I smuggled steroids in for him and uh, attempted to keep that confidential so as to protect him from uh, the usurpation of um, his authority within the organization uh, that um, he controlled. And he was actually non-Hispanic, which is quite odd. Right. Mm -hmm. to, to be and he was what, the, the Mexican mob? Or mafia, Mexican mafia, the Emmy, La, La Emmy. La Emmy, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that's that's odd for him to be uh, non-Hispanic, but to run that organization. It depends on who you ask. Okay, you know, it it it's like anything else. You know, every power base in the world is predicated upon economics, and gangs are no different. Mm -hmm. you know, in that, so their power base is based on economics and. Joe had the connections to facilitate uh, revenues. Mm -hmm. And of course, so that was his power base and the um, foundation for his control of the organization. Yeah. Now, we mentioned American Me. That there's, I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever actually seen the movie, but there is a white mm -hmm. guy there. That he's played by an actor by the name of William Forsyth, who's a terrific mm -hmm. actor. He's played... And in tons of movies, he played Sammy Gravano um, mm -hmm. in the HBO movie The Gotti, but he was also mm -hmm. in American Me, and mm -hmm. along with Danny Trejo. Mm -hmm. um, and Trejo, who actually spent time in prison, uh, him and Danny? Eddie both, you know, made it in the movies afterwards. Did you know Danny at all? Danny, no, I don't know Danny, but uh, I know that Danny's the real deal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our paths didn't cross. You know, uh, you want to remember that I spent. Um, in 1975, I went into the hole. Well, actually, 1976, I went into the hole, and I did not leave. I, I thereafter did not go to a main line until the 2000s. Oh shit! Yeah. So. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, it is. But uh, you know, so I didn't cross paths with a number of individuals unless it was just in passing. Um, you know, whether that be the the hospital at San Quentin, New Miller Hospital. You know, but um, I do know that Danny's the real deal. Yeah, and and you spoke, I think, on on Vlad's interview. You know, that movie, American Me, had a lot of, uh, I guess, collateral damage after the fact. A number of individuals were were killed over it, mm -hmm. uh, and what was considered, I guess, unfair adaptation, maybe, would be a way to put it. Um, and even mm -hmm. Edward Jones, almost the the leader of the movie, basically had to make a payoff because his name was was on a chopping block as well. That is my understanding, yes. And, um, you know, it's it's um, a slippery slope. Absolutely. Um, you know, whenever you're doing something like that. And, uh, you know, by my estimation, um, it, nine to ten people lost their lives mm -hmm. as a result of that movie production. I haven't seen it, um, you know, so I can't really comment on it. I, you know, they allowed television... Um, in prison, I think beginning in 1975, and uh, they actually issued a little 13-inch black and white. But um, and I was given one, 
but I never plugged it in. I used it as a seat. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't watch television. Oh, probably until um, 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was only at the insistence of my wife, who wanted me to uh, understand uh, the reality of what the culture at, out here had become. And uh, I did turn it on. I did look at it. And um, to be honest with you, I was not impressed. Um, and indeed, if my thinking was that if that's reality, I really don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. The the movie Shot Caller, mm-hmm. uh, not so much the the time in prison, because I think no movie can justify what it's really like being in prison. Um, well well can, said. Well I, said. I think it can give you some ideas. Mm-hmm. But what I really liked about that movie was the lead up of him going to prison. He starts out this straight laced white guy with some friends out at a nice restaurant, having some drinks. He mm-hmm. goes, I think it's been a couple of years since I've seen it, but I think he runs a red light, ultimately winds up killing somebody. Then that sends him to prison for vehicular mm-hmm. manslaughter DUI. Mm-hmm. Then he comes in, not nobody that would fare well in prison by his look mm-hmm. and stature mm-hmm. and, and nature. And then he basically has to make a choice for survival. And then that led him into, you know, getting involved with the Aaron brotherhood, then riding up, rising up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because that is a very, very easy situation for a lot of people to to find themselves in. You know, I've got tons of friends that go out, they have drinks at a restaurant and they choose to get in there and drive home. And you're, you're one missed stoplight away, one running of a stop sign away from causing something like that and be in prison for a very long time for a stupid mistake. And then once you're in there, man, you've got no idea. And especially in that movie, you know, that guy had never been to prison, no experience. If you don't have any idea of how things roll in there, you, you, you learn very, very fast. Well, those were precisely the circumstances under which I entered prison. Exactly. And, um, you know, the story, I suppose, is similar in the sense that you know, you have a choice to make. There are no answers. There's only choices. Exactly. And so once you realize that, then you make your choices, and uh, which I did, and, and apparently this individual, this character in this movie did. And, um, you know, you rise to a position of um, sustainability mm-hmm. as it relates to your survival. And one of the reasons that I think people seek protection, and I've heard there's a lot of stories and i'm sure you probably heard some of them of guys that were you know sexually abused in prison that is a a fact that it happens it happens quite a lot i think there was a big uh right the guy they called the booty bandit was it wayne robertson no that's rudy the brute oh, yeah rudy the, I mean, yeah rudy the brute i'm sorry yeah rudy the brute mm-hmm. um the uh would guys come to the ab for protection from that oh certainly Certainly. And then how, how would they not, pay you guys? That's not something that would be tolerated first and foremost, but as you develop your uh, infrastructure, you're looking to utilize individuals in some capacity. So the idea is, is that, you know, you don't put a, a knife in the hand of an individual that isn't capable of using it. You're just setting him on a mission for failure. Right. And, um, you know, that was a circumstance I had with the uh, young me- Mexican men in the chapel. You know, they had the knives taped into their hands. They were sent on a mission to fail, essentially. And so what you do is you recognize um, what attributes um, an individual has toward uh, clerking, working in the kitchen, whatever it may be. And so one of the things that the brand did by way of their infrastructure is that they placed individuals in positions and jobs that would keep the brand in form of what was going on within the prison. So that if someone was ducketed to a specific place at a certain time, you knew that. If you wanted somebody ducketed to a certain place at a certain time, you could facilitate that. And um, so you take individuals uh, of the ilk that you're addressing and you determine um, their aptitude. And then you give them a job, you assign them to a job in keeping with that aptitude. And so they essentially work for the brand in that capacity and are loyal to the brand in that capacity. Yeah. I remember one of the documentaries, I can't remember who it was that was talking, but they were interviewing him. 
And so obviously he's a brand member, you know, he's not what I would consider a soft individual, mm -hmm. but you could just tell in the way he was telling the story. He said, you know, it happened a lot. And he's like, there's no other sound quite like somebody screaming in pain from being sodomized in a cell from another male individual. Like that's, it's I've, I've said it myself. Yeah. I mean, one of the standouts in my own memory, you know, is listening to an individual being raped in a cell. Um, you know, and of course, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, you know, it's another form of, I believe in, in psychological murder. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a form of psychological murder. Yeah. You know, when, when, when that happens. And uh, whether it be in prison or out of prison, uh, whether it happened to a man, a woman, or a child, it's psychological murder by my estimation. And um, should be dealt with accordingly. Unfortunately, it's not. But um, I knew individuals like Roger Dale Smith. They called him Pincushion Smith. Um, you know, I know um, at a minimum he raped over 100 men. Jeez. And uh, probably twice that. And, um, you know, he was stabbed uh, because of it by the brand, um, which garnered him the name Pincushion mm -hmm. because he was stabbed uh, in different instances well over 100 times. You know, one time he was stabbed and thrown off the fifth tier, landed upside down in a trash bucket and lived. So, yeah, you know, he he uh, committed suicide, uh, oh, what was it, around 2011 in Lancaster, at the prison in Lancaster. By, um, he had cancer, and uh, so he took uh, two hypodermic needles and crossed them over his arms into his veins and shot air into his veins. Of course, when that hit his brain, um, an aneurysm occurred and it killed him. Wow. Now that's something that the brand, did, did they get into any sort of like basically running prostitution because that does happen in prison? Was that something that they mess with or not? Sure. Yeah. You have prostitution. Um, what you're not doing is you're not taking individuals and turning them out, so to speak, right. and then for forcing them into prostitution. You have These are willing individuals. Yes, you have individuals who are gay, and um, essentially they're utilized um, as women, and uh, whether it be for other inmates or staff, both, and uh, so that you have that. And um, I always found them uh, extremely valuable. Staff. Um, mm -hmm. Prison staff? Most, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. Wow. Yeah. You had prison staff who were members of the brand. Um, so it, just as you did prison staff who were members of the Black, Black Gorilla family or Black Panthers or Mexican Mafia. I mean, you, that's just a reality. You know, the most recent indictment of the brand, for instance, included prison, uh, prison staff um, as members. But... Um, you know, you're, um, you're homosexuals and, um, you know, LGBTQ community. I'm, I'm not quite uh, abreast, if you will, of the um, being politically correct in so far as the terminology. So I'll just use what I know. So the homosexuals back then um, were really an excellent source of information uh, in their interactions with staff and other inmates by way of what they reported uh, back um, by way of pillow talk. Okay. And uh, so the, I always found them to be a very, very valuable resource. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. People tend mm -hmm. to be uh, vulnerable with information during intimate times, no matter mm -hmm. what that situation may entail, be it in prison or not. Yes. Okay. Now to, to flip that from, you know, that sort of interaction to the complete opposite, prison fights you were actually uh real close to wasn't there like a, a case brought against guards that were actually facilitating like prisoner fights yeah they called them gladiator fights yeah gladiator fights and that was at corcoran and yes i was involved in that um i not only was engaged in fights myself um but i was the captain's clerk at the time and um, as such, in the case of uh, the execution of one prisoner by a guard, he was shot in the head by him. Um, 
you know, that incident was, as a clerk, was brought to me two hours before it even happened with the three individuals that were going to be involved and how he was killed. And that's exactly what happened. So what happened as a result of that is that um, when I discovered that, I took that to a lieutenant that I also worked for and um, knew him to be um, uncorruptible. A uh, former sheriff who went to work for the Department of Corrections. That's a rare thing. And it is a rare thing, but you have them. And um, so he took that and investigated himself and came to the same conclusion that uh, this individual had been set up and, in fact, had been murdered um, by a guard. So he took that, he attempted to take that to the FBI. But uh, in the course of taking those documents out of the prison, um, he was cut off by the special services unit just as he arrived with the FBI. So you have a situation where you have him pulling up on a street there in Corcoran next to the canal, the FBI pulling up in front of him, and the SSU, that's the special services unit at the Department of Corrections, coming in from the flank. And um, the FBI and the SSU were throwing down on each other because they know that this individual has documents that they don't want the FBI to see. Um, as it turns out, he testifies before the Senate Select Committee, before Gloria Romero, who's now in Congress, the United States Congress, but then was a state senator. And she was the chairperson of the uh, select, Senate Select Committee at that time. And she took testimony relative to these gladiator fights. And this particular individual, um, as a lieutenant, testified. And when he was testifying, he was um, wearing a bulletproof vest. And she acknowledged that. Uh, she stopped the proceedings and said, excuse me, sir, but are you wearing a bulletproof vest? And he said, uh, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, may I ask why? So he related the story of fellow guards having committed a drive-by shooting on his home uh, in order to instill in him sufficient fear so as not to testify. Um, so you have that. You know, you have what's referred to as the Green Wall, um, which is a gang of guards uh, that um, D.J. Vodicka exposed. He was a member of the um, institution's investigative services unit and uh, saw this firsthand and exposed it. And he, too, went before the Senate Select Committee and exposed that fact and then, indeed, uh, wrote a book about it. Wow. Called The Green Wall. And didn't the guy that was essentially set up to be murdered, it wouldn't even, like, spit in the CO's face or something like that? That's what kind of transpired that? It is. It, um, the individual's name was Preston Tate. And Preston was in his cell, and the officer confronting him uh, was also black. And uh, they got in an argument. And, of course, you know, one of the um, ultimate forms of disrespect within the prison system is spitting. Um, and so they were in an argument, and Preston spit in this officer's face. Now, this was a floor officer. But um, so the next day, the arrangement was made for Preston to go to the yard with two of his enemies, knowing that that was going to result in an altercation. And this officer, who, who as I said, was a floor officer, uh, went up into the gun tower, retrieved the nine millimeter. And when the altercation between Preston Tate and two of his enemies began, he shot Preston in the head. These prison fights that you guys were doing. Um, which I'm assuming there wasn't a whole lot of choice in the matter if the guards were facilitating this was, and I'm assuming also not only for their entertainment, there was probably gambling going on in the fights probably as amongst the prisoners as well. Well, I don't know about amongst the prisoners to, to that, which, because you're talking about um, a shoe unit and okay. as such, you don't really have that kind of communication. Okay. Um, but I do know that um, staff were taking book. And uh, working in my capacity as the captain's clerk, those fights were videotaped. And then those videotapes would be brought up to the support building where I worked. And then staff from other yards would come and they would view it. And, um, you know, that's why it's referred to as gladiator school. They, of course, weren't, were not taking book at the time they were viewing the video, but uh, it was a source of entertainment. Wow. Um. And then that actually did get brought out into that case like you were talking about. Was there any convictions on that of those guards? No, there was actually eight guards indicted and uh, all were acquitted. Imagine that. Um, 
Imagine that. <laughs> uh the situation that kind of led you going away from the AB because it really kind of crossed the line was the murder of I think two children and a woman. Was that the murder that involved Curtis Price? Yes, it, it is. Tell us a little bit about that one, like how that came about and then the process of it going through. And that was a situation where um, Robert Griffin and Junior Snyder had um, killed uh, an individual named Steve Gibson. And uh, that's when, uh, the, I'll back up a little bit here. Uh, when T.D. Bingham and I were in an altercation with the Mexican Mafia in San Quentin, the aftermath of that uh, naturally was leading towards warfare. So um, I had Joe Morgan, who was in the L.A. County Jail at that time, uh, pull me out to court to L.A. County Jail so that we could sit down and discuss what we, how we were going to resolve this. Um, meanwhile, um, in Palm Hall at Chino, which is the hole there, um, a young man named Steve Gibson um, essentially um, did something that he should not have done. He was disrespectful to Emmy members on the tier. And as a result of that, they were going to kill him. And, um, you know, Robert and Junior um, interceded and they killed him. Um, he didn't do anything that warranted his death. But in any event, they killed him. They killed him on the yard and they got away with it. Stephen Barnes witnessed that as a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And I suppose what happened with him is that uh, it so often happens it, <clears throat> excuse me, made him paranoid, um, primarily because of the stealth involved with it. It was a need to know basis. So um, he observed this taking place. He didn't know that it was going to take place. He was a member of the brand. And um, so it brought into question his own survival. As a result, he stepped away from the brand and cooperated with law enforcement insofar as the prosecution of uh, Robert and Junior. And um, so Robert was the one that brought the matter uh, to the circle uh, insofar as the need to, because Steve could not be gotten to, he was in protective custody, that the brand should then take it upon themselves um, to influence Steve by murdering his wife and child and parents. And um, so there was a lot of discussion about that. And in the end, uh, I was the only one that voted against it. Uh, I was able to dissuade them from taking the daughter's life, the mother's life, and the mother's life. Um, but I was not able to dissuade them from taking the father's life. And um, based on that need to know basis, that then turned to Curtis and Robert and others who were facilitating setting up um, this assassination. Um, meanwhile, I was sent back to San Quentin, and um, um, a message was received from Curtis that uh, he had carried out that assassination. Um, as a result of that, in order to acquire the weapons necessary to facilitate that assassination, he had bludgeoned to, to death a young woman by the name of Elizabeth Hickey and um, stole her uh, weapons, her guns. Um, he used one of those weapons to assassinate Richard Barnes, who was Stephen Barnes's father. So these were activities that um, I did not agree with and um, realized um, that I could not condone. So it was that in association with a number of other factors, I suppose not the least of which was the um, execution of Margot Compton, her two twin six-year-old daughters, and her boyfriend. Now, Margot had testified against the second in command of the Hells Angels, Buck Garrett. Um, he received a, she testified on behalf of the feds, and um, Buck received a four-year sentence as a result of a conviction stemming from pimping and pandering. And uh, Margot was a meth head. So when she, she was hidden out by the feds in Oregon, but because of her meth addiction, she contacted her connection in the Bay Area. And of course, the Bay Area um, meth trade was controlled by the Hells Angels. So once her connection learned where she was at, he conveyed that information to the Hells Angels. And Buck sent two shooters up. Uh, they went into her home. Uh, her boyfriend, Gary, was on the couch. 
They capped him in the head. They went into the bedroom. They took the two little girls, two six-year-old twin girls, and they wrapped their arms around their teddy bears. They held Margot and made her watch them shoot the little girls in the head, and then they shot her. And that was supposed to send a message. So, you know, as a result of that, uh, I disassociated any further um, business um, with the brand and the Hells Angels, and then set a course to knowing who the, one of the shooters was, and he was now incarcerated at San Quentin. Um, I was going to kill him. But um, the incident with T.D. Bingham and I and the Mexican Mafia um, coincided with those events. So I gave priority to attempting to de-escalate the potential warfare. And um, that individual, whose name is um, Bob McClure, slipped through the cracks. Mm -hmm. So that when I made the decision to step away, you know, that was one of the influences. Stephen Barnes was one of the influences. And I had been approached by a number of my elders who confronted me relative to what they referred to as serving two fires my involvement with the Aryan Brotherhood and the way in which I was raised. So I believed that I had a choice to make, and I made that choice, and that choice was to step away from the brand. But in making that choice, I felt that I had a responsibility uh, because I was instrumental in developing the infrastructure of the brand, which obviously led to this um, perversion in thinking relative to that Western ethos and that what I believed was a warrior code of conduct uh, to take innocent life, to bring that organization down. So I began to cooperate with law enforcement as it relates to these two instances and provided in-court testimony as it relates to the death of Margot Compton and the death of Stephen Barnes. There were a number of cases in which I would not cooperate in, um, the RICO prosecution I referenced earlier would be one um, because I knew that the individuals that were involved in those cases were lying. And um, although I had been involved in cases in which law enforcement wanted me to lie in my testimony, I refused to do so. I suffered um, numerous beatings as a result of that. But that's another story. Point is, is that in my um, defection from the brand, um, I took it upon myself uh, to take a a stand um, for this idea that uh, innocent people uh, would not and shall not be um, imposed upon um, by the brand or any other organization. And um, and actually, I continue to take that stand. And that's about nonviolence. Well, my vow of nonviolence is on a personal level. That's you know, that which I will engage in, you know, I am by no stretch of the imagination a pacifist. Mm -hmm. um, but I did take a, non, a vow of nonviolence so that, um, interestingly enough, in the last attempt on my life, which was in 2015, um, I had the opportunity to um, kill an individual who was attempting to kill me and instead um, uh, took his weapon away from him and um, uh, did not respond violently to him. And uh, I think that was, um, I was given consideration for that ultimately um, in my release from prison. And that's, uh, I think I've heard you say, and I don't want to quote you, but you had a vision of your wife calling you by your native name, Sky, mm. and to not do that. Yeah, that actually happened. We had started uh, the nonprofit uh, Live, Learn, and Prosper in prison. And so we were working with um, a lot of individuals, over 600 individuals in that particular prison. And I had been teaching them um, the value of nonviolence. In other words, that there's another way to deal with situations other than violently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then in the course of this individual attempting to cut my throat, he had um, come at me from behind successfully and um, um, knocked me semi-unconscious. So that in the process of attempting to cut my throat, I'd blocked him. I, I couldn't see, but I could hear. And um, he cut my ear in half and he got the back of my throat. But in the third attempt that he made, I took the weapon away from him. And in that instance, uh, instant rather, of removing that weapon from his hand, um, it occurred to me that I could break his neck. And um, in that nanosecond, if you will, 
I heard my wife's voice say, no, Sky. And um, that actually stopped me. And I'm grateful for that. Um, so, you know, it had an enormous impact on the population that we had been teaching um, because essentially they perceived it as me practicing what I was preaching to them. And um, so it had a uh, great value. And, you know, I refer to it as the opportunity bias, taking that uh, a relatively negative situation and seeing the positive in that. And in this case, the positive was the influence that it had upon the um, general population of that particular prison. Was one of the instances you were talking about earlier with those murders, was that where you had to be taken into the courtroom in a hollowed out vending machine for your protection? That, yeah, that was in my testimony against the Hells Angels in Oregon. And see, that that just proves how deep, because we've had, I've had guys that, uh, ATF agents that have infiltrated the Hells Angels. I've had other ATF agents that's worked with other biker gangs and they went undercover. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the amount of resources that those groups have to find out things, I think, reaches far beyond what the general public even fathoms. Well, and, you're right. Yes, you, I absolutely agree with you. And that was one that you were actually, they, they what did they do? Just construct a, a hollowed out vending machine. And that was what they used to get you in and out of that courtroom. Because yeah, that essentially. Was mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the issue that we faced there, you, the resources, as you correctly point out, um, were substantial. And so they had learned, they'd convoyed me into the courthouse, a convoy of cars uh, with air support. Um, and they would switch the, the car that I was in each time. Um, and then they would take a different route each time. But um, the Hells Angels had learned uh, which car I was going to be in and they placed a bomb under it. Um, and that was discovered. So, you know, that being the case, and another instance was they had placed me into a substation. And um, so an individual would come in on a drunk driving within that substation. And one of the, my handlers, um, who was with the LA Sheriff's Department at that time, uh, it was a combined effort of sheriffs and um, Department of Justice and FBI um, that were essentially my handlers. And so uh, he had a sense of this individual that was in a holding tank that had come in for DUI. And so he took a Polaroid picture of him and he brought it back to where I was at and wanted to know if I recognized him. And I did. And so they put him into an x-ray machine and found that he had a 25 automatic keister. And that once they um, debriefed him, uh, learned that he was there to execute me. And um, then another instance in which I was never able to substantiate, so I, I can't really say that it's fact, um, was that um, there was an individual that was disguised as a priest that was discovered on a roof with a sniper rifle. Um, so those are just, you know, um, the, those variables that came into play that made them, that made the decision, essentially, uh, to find another way to bring me into the courthouse um, undetected. My friend, you are, even even after spending so much time in the prison system, 45 years, I've got to think, and I, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but you are a blessed individual because after getting shot 22 times, 18 knife fights, 45 years in prison in and of itself, mm -hmm. and the countless attempts on your life, mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't be sitting there having this conversation with me right now. Well, I agree with that, you know, it, and it, it, it brings home the idea that um, I have a purpose. Exactly. And that was my I, next statement. You're here for a reason. I am. And I look very seriously at that. So along the way, in the course of those 45 years, I've had um, a number of people help me, you know, that have been extremely kind to me and generous and um, have assisted me in my own journey, uh, whether that be toward my education, um, or just learning in general. You know, I became an alcohol and drug counselor while incarcerated. That's something that the state paid for. You know, that was a $17,000 price tag uh, so that I became a certified alcohol and drug counselor. And then the state put me to work as a drug counselor in prison uh, where I was dealing with addicts. Um, and that was my actual job. But my point is, is that over the course of that, um, I've had a lot of people help me. 
And um, so, you know, it's, you know, you, you're probably familiar with the term paying it forward. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, I believe in that. Uh, so, you know, the idea of, of bringing up Live, Learn and Prosper uh, while I was in prison and now that I'm out of prison, continuing that process um, is a part of giving back. And uh, I think that's important. Uh, it goes to um, my, on th my own authenticity um, and my own redemption. You know, people say, well, if you maintained your innocence throughout relative to the commitment offense, where's the redeeming factor come in? Well, that comes in in joining a gang and the amazing level in, of violence that I was engaged in. Um, you know, that, you know, I don't shy away from the fact that uh, I've committed atrocious acts of violence. Um, that's just a reality. And so um, my responsibility is to look that square in the face and express that um, for the purposes, hopefully, of educating the public about how these things happen, why they happen, and um, why there is a need for um, reform across the board relative to how we handle prisons, how we handle our judiciary, and, and um, you know, our politicians and otherwise. So, you know, there's, by my estimation, a lot of work that needs to be done. And um, so I suppose um, in that, um, I'm very active um, in telling my story. Um, you know, I get a lot of pushback. I get charges that are brought against me for political reasons. I'm dealing with that right now. I was about we'll to say, continue. I think you have one of those going right now. I do. But I see it for what it is. Um, you know, I know how they operate. I know how they work. Um, I know their political base, and um, I know how to fight. And uh, I'm not just talking physically. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, I do believe I have a purpose. Well, and I think a lot of things that you're bringing to light, I'll use the term they. When, mm. when you have something that you're bringing to light that I think they don't want people to hear and, and mm -hmm. understand this, what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. behind those walls. Cause you know, the sad part is nobody really feels those effects. I mean, some people do obviously if they've losing loved ones, but the actual effects that happen to you in prison are just mm -hmm. that they're, they're felt in prison. Those on the outside can't, can't put themselves in that place. And I think they want to keep that so separate and, and not let it get out to the public of exactly what's going on behind those walls. So when you have an individual such as yourself that spent you know, an enormous amount of time behind bars associated mm -hmm. with gangs like the Aryan Brotherhood, who also worked mm -hmm. hand in hand with the LIMA, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. you have a lot of information that they probably do not want getting out to the general public. So the fact that they're trying to to silence you by any means necessary, whether that be trumped up charges on on this or that, is really not very surprising to me. And I'm probably sure not to you either. It's not. I mean, it's it's I I, I think I could have done a little better in anticipating it. Um, but you know, it's like when I went into my original trial, I thought the idea in my naivete, I thought all I had to do was go in and tell the truth. It doesn't work like that. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's, you know, I take issue, uh, with prosecutors who are only interested in conviction as opposed to the truth or justice. Well, and, uh, you know, 100%. when you look at the, when you look at the innocence project and you see how many people have now been removed from prison after decades of being convicted of a crime that we now know they didn't commit. And we know that through technology. So that, that I think that it, it allows us to go back and look at the process that was involved there and how that actually happened. You know, was the evidence really there? And um, you see, so the, it really comes down to a personality contest. And uh, I think these are the things as a society that we need to overcome. Absolutely. Um, you know, I the idea of, of, yeah. So, you know, in my case, I'm dealing with individuals that um, as administrators were corrupt and uh, they know that and they know that I know that. Um, and so, you know, they they use their power base. They have a license and it's taxpayer supported. So I know what I'm up against and it's substantial. And so, you know, it requires um adhering to a learning curve and that learning curve can be huge. Yeah. And uh, so you have to be patient and I am. And, um, you know, it's a process. And, and a lot of times too, even if you can prove, you know, that they were in the wrong, they have prosecutorial immunity 
So yes. there's not even really nothing that can be done about it. And that's well, now here in California, that's not the case. Really? And that's that's yes, it's actually a result of of um corruption. And so uh, what the governor has signed in um, to law is that where a prosecutor, say, for instance, withholds exculpatory evidence mm -hmm. against an individual, that can now be prosecuted. They no longer um, enjoy that qualified immunity as a result of something which is um, so blatant yeah. as withholding exculpatory evidence or um, tampering with, with witnesses, obstruction of justice. You know, in my own case right now, I've, I've had all those things happen. You know, I've had the investigator go to witnesses and say, you don't want to get involved in this case. Now, if I did that, what would happen? Yeah. You see, I would be immediately charged with obstruction of justice. You see, and tampering with witnesses. But they can get away. The, I want to say, isn't the term Brady violation, too, where they don't uh, disclose all their evidence? Yes, that is a Brady violation. And, um, you know, you have that, but now there, this law is in place and it, it needs to be used, um, you know, and, um, you know, to date it, um, I can't really, I don't have the stats to say how much it has been used, but I know that it's not much. And, um, but it is another tool, you know, toward combating corruption. And that's a good thing. Yeah. So, you know, and it isn't to say that, uh, you know, and perhaps I should say, and perhaps it needs to be said, that I know many people in law enforcement that um, are absolutely authentic in what they do and how they do it, and um, good people, and, um, you know, uphold the law. And that's true in prison also. I've known many guards who I'm still in contact with today um, that are good people and did their job and did it effectively and treated people as human beings. And, um, you know, that code of ethics that not only guards have in prison, but that law enforcement has out here on the street, they adhere to that and they believe in that. And uh, they uphold that. So, you know, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, the, the judiciary is all corrupt and those associated with it are corrupt. It's, it's a very small minority of individuals, you know, that for whatever reason get caught up and um, it would appear can't help themselves. You know, in that, you know, that power um, does something to people. You know, that license that they have does something to people, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and I, um, I think the saying is absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think, you know, I think that's true, probably. Yeah. You know, by my estimation, it's true. Even individuals that aren't necessarily corrupt in lieu of maybe taking something they're not supposed to for one reason or another, I think you alluded to earlier, you know, a lot of times prosecutors are looking for that conviction rate. They don't really care if they even have a iota of belief that you might be innocent because that's right. essentially how they progress in their field. You it know, is. the more people they put behind bars, the better they look on the stat sheet. You essentially become a stat, your life mm -hmm. and the fact that you may or may not even be guilty of the crime that you were, you know, found guilty of. Mm. is irrelevant they're, they're you're a stat on a sheet to try to get them promoted to you know a higher ladder up the food chain higher link on the food chain if you will and mm. that's what i think i'm I'm absolutely behind you on that 100 percent. i any any help i can do to you know spread any kind of word on that i i interviewed an individual not too long ago and his interview is coming out next week called jeffrey deskovic mm -hmm. and he was out of new york and he was uh convicted of rape and murder of a 17 year old classmate of his, and mm -hmm. he done every bit of that 17 years until the innocence project, mm -hmm. uh, finally ran the DNA. And the problem was there was never DNA collected on him anyway, mm -hmm. but they ran DNA that was collected on the person that actually did it. It matched the person that actually did it. And mm -hmm. then he then admitted to doing the murder and he was freed. And then he ultimately became a lawyer and pursues mm -hmm. cases like this of the wrongful convicted. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I want to start doing a little bit more of finding people that were wrongfully convicted because it's, I don't want to be this one to say everybody in prison's innocent. I, I do believe some people probably committed crimes and deserve to be there, but they're actually is, most, most people. Yeah. Most people, yeah. but there yeah. is definitely a percentage that's way mm -hmm. too much. Even mm -hmm. if it's 10%, that's way too much that yeah, is. Are, in, are in prison and not supposed to be there. The impact that it has upon not only the individual, but their family, the community. I mean, it's, it's, it's referred to as a ripple effect yes. and it's enormous. 
You know, but if you, if you just look at the idea of plea bargains, you know, going back to the um, prosecution itself, you know, um, depending on your status in life, you know, even though you did not commit the crime, you may be better off taking that plea bargain. Yeah, because absolutely. if you don't, if you don't, what's going to happen is you may spend the rest of your life in prison. You know, the fact of your innocence is irrelevant. Yeah. Now you're just looking to, to, to come out of this situation as best you can. Yeah, the least because, amount of time as possible. Yes, because the prosecution is so aggressive towards that conviction. You know, that does not happen with people who have the resources available to them to fight that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it only happens with the disenfranchised. Yeah. You know, and that does not just encompass uh, our so-called minority populations, whether it be black or Mexican, although it happens way too often. But it also happens with white people, mm -hmm. you know, who are disenfranchised also because they live in poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of veterans. Uh, it breaks my heart. That not only live on the street, but as a result of some circumstances, are then brought into court and prosecuted, you see, because they suffer from PTSD. So rather than address the PTSD issue, they incarcerate them. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. these are individuals, men and women, who have served this country, you know, and they are owed the opportunity to heal from whatever they suffer, whatever that may be. You know, it's not for me to say. I'm not a soothsayer. And I don't pretend to be. But when I, I do know that when our veterans suffer, that we have an obligation as a society to not only support them, but to help them. Absolutely. And that's your your spot on too about the the plea deals, because all that is like you said, I've heard people say, well, you know, if I was innocent, you know, or if I was innocent of something, I wouldn't plead guilty to it. Well, you say that now because you're not in front mm -hmm. of a courtroom facing 25 right. years. If right. you didn't have the availability to get a, a paid criminal defense attorney, a good one. And there's a good chance that you're going to see 25 years, but they offer you a plea bargain for 10. Well, buddy, that's 15 years less of what you could do if you went to jail and probably would be found guilty. Mm -hmm. So the, the, and it's just a sad fact that the, the public defenders don't have the availability to fight these cases. They, that's they all they do are plea deal makers. Yes. Yes, it is. You know, and it comes down to a quota, but, you know, I don't speak about this just off the top of my head. This is from my own experiences. Oh, absolutely. I did a lot of I did a lot of law, law work behind the iron gates. You know, once I educated myself, then you know, to me, the value of higher education is it essentially just teaches you how to research. So I gave that application to the law, and I filed a lot of my own cases, and I did a lot of law work for other individuals. So I'm speaking from experience when I say that, you know, I know too many black men. Too many Mexican men that did not how did not know how to approach the court. You see, in so far as filing habeas corpus or otherwise relative to their cases, mm -hmm. and you know, I look at how did this conviction even happen? Mm -hmm. What happened to due process? Yeah, you see, uh, you there know, was a. Go ahead. No, it's all right. I was going to say there was a, a period of time and, and I'll speak with you about this off air, but there was a period of time when I was uh, incarcerated for a short period of time, nothing, uh, nothing in prison. This was County jail. Mm -hmm. We're in a holding tank waiting for guys to get seen for bond court. Mm -hmm. And this guy, he had, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the, all the circumstances of it. I didn't ask, but I heard him talking to another individual, him and his sister had gotten to an altercation at the end of the day. I don't know what sparked it. But uh, he, I guess he, he beat up his sister and set her on fire. My goodness. And so he was looking at possibly 25 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to court and then he comes back in the room and he's excited, man. He looks like, you know, he's smiling and just happy and relieved. And, and the guy said, well, what happened? He said, well, I took a plea. He said, I got 15 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to him, to most people, 15 years, you know, that's a devastation that you're going to mm -hmm. be away from your families or loved ones or whoever you got on the outside dog or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. 15 years. But this individual was delighted and happy mm -hmm. that he only got 15 years. And, you know, I'm not sure of the circumstances. He didn't say he had a paid lawyer, but, you know, that's mm -hmm. what it is. You know, you, you're looking at 25 to 30 and you have to be joyful in the fact that you're only going to do half that. Now, mm -hmm. in this particular case, this guy did it. Um, yes. but there's a lot of cases where the person didn't do it. They just do not have the financial means to fight it. And yeah. it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, we're closing in on, 
hour and 45 minutes here. I don't want to keep you much longer, but I do want to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. When you got out, you had been up for parole. How many times did you go up for parole before it was finally granted? 18. 18. Mm -hmm. When you got granted parole, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a movie, and I think you have watched this one, Shawshank mm -hmm. Redemption. Mm -hmm. I have. You know, every time Morgan Freeman went up, he tried to give them the answers they wanted. And then the mm -hmm. final time he was just like, you know, basically he just didn't give a shit. He told him like it was and said, stamp it, send me on back. I don't really give a shit what yeah. you think. And then that time he got approved. Yeah. What was your feeling when you got approved for parole? Unexpected. It was an absolute surprise. You know, I'd been before the board 18 times and I knew what they wanted to hear. You know, and at one point I even said to my wife, I said, look, we both know what they want to hear. If I go in there and tell them what they want to hear, they'll probably release me. And she said, if you do that, you won't come home to me. You see, and I'm blessed, you know, in that, but I was willing to do that for her sake, um, you know, so that we could have our life. But so, you know, each time I went to the board, um, I had no expectation of parole. But I would go in and I would present my case. And in this particular instance, um, I did the same thing. But I was fortunate in that the commissioner that heard my case, Randy Grounds is his name, uh, he was a former warden. And he was old school. And so we sat and we had a conversation. And that conversation uh, resonated with him because he knew I was telling him the truth. And um, he made the decision to release me. And it was an absolute surprise. Wow. I know that had to be overwhelming because you're spending all that time behind bars. What was it like your first, you know, I'll even say just a couple hours in the, in the free world. Cause so much had to be changed from the time when you were incarcerated. Yeah, it was, you know, the issue here is, is that, um, the sensory overload was astronomical. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, thought I was prepared because it's the very thing that I taught groups, you know, was preparedness because the groups I taught those individuals were going to be released. They were serving determinate terms. And so my, my job was to prepare them to go back out into society. And so in that, you know, I assumed that I was prepared and I was not, you know, I did not have any idea. Um, about what I was going out into. And the sensory, like I said, the sensory overload continues to this day. I mean, you know, the, the term uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, there's no question that uh, I suffer from it. So it, you know, it's a matter of, of um, recognizing that and dealing with that. And, um, you know, I still do. So, um, you know, by way of example, I, a friend of mine took me down to the beach and, you know, I'm, I'm water clan. So I wanted to touch the water. Um, we couldn't get to the beach. We couldn't get to the water. There were so many people. I had to walk out on a pier. And when I turned around and looked, it reminded me of an ant colony. Uh, there were so many people. And, you know, it's um, the technology. It's the cars. I mean, it's um, just a, a vast array of things. You know, people have changed. Um, you know, by my, by my estimation, there is a, a lack of um, manners. Um, there's, um, a lot that can be done, I think, uh, toward our collective humanity, toward how we deal with issues. Um, you know, and it makes me think, it makes me think hard, um, about the, you know, the issues that I face as an individual and what others must be facing also, um, whatever their, their trauma may be, you know, it, it, it isn't to suggest that, um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, is always the result of, of trauma, but I think probably 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, that holds true. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we come from all walks of life. And, you know, trauma can encompass an individual being in um, an abusive relationship, you know, a child uh, being molested or, in, you know, being abused in, in the home. I mean, um, women who are raped, I mean, they're just a, a vast array. Again, going back to that uh, idea of uh, psychological murder. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's a huge issue that we need to face and that we need to take head on as a society. And that's that's almost a perfect 
way to describe that because it's something that those individuals, like you said, be it man, woman, or child, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to grow up reliving those experiences. Yes. It's, it's not something they're going to be able to escape. You know, people can say, you know, try to bury it or whatever, but that's just, that's very difficult. If, if at all, even in the realm of a possibility. We're in agreement. Yes. Well, Michael, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and, and sharing your story. It's, it's got a multitude of, of highs, lows, but as we mm -hmm. spoke earlier, you're here after all of that, 45 years in prison, being shot 22 times, 18 knife mm -hmm. fights, multiple attempts mm -hmm. on your life, mm -hmm. and you're here. You have a purpose, my friend, and I think you're on the right track in, in lieu of uh, fulfilling that. Um, you mentioned earlier your business, your uh, Live, Learn, and Prosper. That's a website people mm -hmm. can go and, and check check out. What all do you offer there? Well, it's self-help is what it is, and it's a holistic approach to self-help. You know, they can go on the website. I'm denied access to the internet right now. That's one of the pushbacks I'm getting. But I have brought up my own podcast. Yes. And, you know, they can find that. And I'm going to be putting, hopefully, um, content up on that. And, um, you know, I'd like to hear from people um, about what they would like to discuss. You know, the idea of the podcast are thoughts and observations. You know, I'm I'm not just into telling war stories. I understand the value of those insofar as helping people understand the environment in which I lived for 45 years. Right. But there are much, much deeper issues, you know, not the least of which is my own spirituality and how that influenced my own journey. I think that has value. Now, is that out um, yet or you're in the process of getting that done? It's up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can just, you know, my name and and thoughts and observations and it's, you know, I've only done an intro on it. And again, you know, the impediment is the fact that I don't have access, that I have to bring in a studio engineer um, to do anything like this. Right. So, but I will get it done and uh, it will happen. I'll be in court this next week. Um, I'm putting forth a motion to uh, take me off of um, house arrest, which I'm on, and um, and to give me back the internet. So should that occur, then then people can look to hear from me. But I would encourage anyone that has a question, um, please ask, and I'll do my best to answer. And, it, you know, whatever avenues you feel comfortable discussing, how would they go about reaching you? Well, they can go on. Um, again, I have a third party that accesses the website. Even though I can't put content up, there's uh, an e email address there that they can come on. And um, I'll make sure that they get a response. If they want to come up on the podcast, they can come in and um, leave a query, um, whatever that may be, because, you know, I have those printed out and I'm able to read them and um, I will respond to that. And hopefully I'll respond to it live um, on the podcast itself. But, um, you know, in, in I'm deeply appreciative of this opportunity. Anytime that I have an opportunity to talk about these things in this type of form, I'm deeply grateful. Well, I I can't thank you enough for, for coming on. And I wanted to make sure I, I did my due diligence and, and research. And I hope I've been able to bring some other questions that, you know, other people have in as far as relationships yes. in certain instances. Um, because I know that telling you know, certain parts of the same story can get redundant at times. So I yes. do my best to try to bring a little something new uh, mm -hmm. when individuals choose to come on my show. And I hope you enjoyed it. I did very much so. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much. Again, we'll put on YouTube, we'll put a link to your website, Live, Learn, and Prosper on there. Um, we wish you luck next week going back to court. Thank you. Hopefully everything. If you will, if you will put a link on the uh, the podcast too. I went, now, where is it? Is it on all platforms, YouTube, audio? Where's that at? It's on YouTube. On YouTube. And like I said, it's just my name, thoughts, and observations. Okay. And that should that should bring you into the link. We will absolutely do that. We will tag you. I'll go follow it and subscribe as well as soon as we get off. I would heard you in other interviews that you were getting it going, but uh, yes. I didn't know. I don't know the dates on those. A lot of times I'll just put on, you know, Michael, it'll have a list of ones you've done, and I just let it play all day while I'm at work. So, as far as the dates they come yeah. out, I wasn't up to snuff. Yeah. What I've done is I had an opportunity to put up an intro and I've done that. And, you know, and that's, it's been a while since I've done that. So, you know, the idea of going into court just give me the opportunity to bring up content. 
Well, again, like I said, we wish you the best outcome. Hopefully they can, you. Uh, you know, let you get to work because what you're doing here, I think is very beneficial and Thank a lot you. of people can benefit from it. A lot of the young folks can benefit from it. I've told a lot of people, I haven't told them who, but I said, I've got a really good interview coming and look forward. Hopefully mm -hmm. I'm hopefully I have this posted by the end of the month mm -hmm. and just it's, it's a story that I think can resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. Like I said about that movie, a lot of people like to watch movies, but this is an actual story that's very similar to your story. Now, oftentimes when I first watched that movie, you were the first person I thought of because the individual did bear a striking resemblance to you a little bit. That's the suggestion that has been made that that is actually taken from my story, which is fine, you know, but uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing in my podcast is, is actually watching these movies now and doing a comparative analysis as to how authentic they are. That's a great idea. I think you're on to something there. That is a great idea. I think that would be fantastic for you to do. I think it would be great mm -hmm. content for your listeners because that's often the thing that you watch when you watch TV shows such as like Oz which was a HBO's kind of first landmark television show way before Sopranos mm -hmm. and other ones where it highlighted people in prison. And mm -hmm. it was a, it was a really good show. It was edgy. It was raw. It was not a lot of things on like it at the time and really hasn't been on there since. I don't think they would probably let you get away with a lot of stuff they did back right. then, now. but it right. was, it was very good. So I would love to hear someone that has had those experiences such as yourself on TV shows and, and films. I, I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Michael Thompson. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Please go check out his YouTube channel. We will put a link to that in the description. Go check out Live, Learn, and Prosper. And we hope you enjoyed this interview. Again, Michael, a thousand thank yous, my friend, for coming on. I enjoyed it really much. My pleasure. You take care. All right. Thank you.